Welcome everyone to another episode of the Revenue Throughput Podcast. Today's guest is Simon Severino of Strategy Sprints. And we're gonna talk about daily, weekly, and monthly habits that can drive real change and real growth in your business. Simon's an expert at this. He's gonna share some real interesting insights, practical tips, things you can immediately apply And if you're like me, an entrepreneur, you're going to listen in and you're going to say, wow, I can start doing that right now. That's the kind of stuff we're going to get from Simon. So let's welcome him to the show right now. Well, welcome Simon Severino to the Revenue Throughput Podcast. Welcome, everybody. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, Simon, uh, just to provide context, um, who do you serve and what do you do for them primarily? I'm sure there's many things you might do, but what would you say is the primary focus? I coach online businesses, mainly professional services and software builders on how to run a company in these funky times in a way that is smooth and creates more freedom, more impact uh, every month and uh, double sales in 90 days. Wow. Well, I like the double sales in 90 days part. That's very strong. And, you know, we've met before, we've talked before, and I know that the work you do is is really has, has a track record of success. And one of the reasons I wanted you on the show is I, I do believe, although you have a specialization in terms of who you work with, principles often are principles, right? So anyone listening to this podcast saying, well, I don't run a software company. I'm a, I'm a manufacturer or something. I'd say, listen closely because we're going to discover some principles here in talking with Simon that are probably very applicable to just about any B2B business, just because they're true. So one thing that I like to get into with you, and I know it's one area that you, that you really help people with is when things seem, I guess, uh, confusing, murky, dark, kind of like driving in a fog to defog to get, that's like a step one kind of thing. What are some best practices that you help companies with, and how to get clarity, you know, when it seems like I just don't know what's going on, exactly what to do next. How do you provide or how do you help companies get to that point of clarity? That's a great question. And since manufacturers are listening here, think of your supply chain and how really we are all in the dark. Nobody knows what's going on with the supply chain next week and in two weeks. You might miss parts. You might lose suppliers because they go broke. Uh, some some suppliers may merge with other suppliers, then it changes your price. It delays your schedule. So really, that's exactly the situation manufacturers are in right now, that we are, we are all flying blind. Nobody knows what's going on next week. Not even the strategy advisors. And uh, I am one of those who usually come in and say, yeah, but I got the benchmarks and I can tell you some studies. We can tell nothing right now. And we are for the first time humbled by the situation and uh, honest enough uh, to not, not to do as if we had the answers. The only thing that we have, 5% is only in our control. The content, nobody knows. Nobody knows right now. Today, I have five interviews and in between interviews, I'm trying to buy old coins because they are at minus 7%, minus 8%. In between these interviews, the the price changed five times. For me, it's 2 p.m. and I have had an amazingly volatile morning. That's the rate of change we are in right now. And it's exciting because we have six major technological disruption coming in at once robotics, AI, blockchain, etc. They are coming in at once and they are hard to predict, impossible to predict. So what can we really do? 5% only is in our control. And these are the three habits that we implement with our clients. Daily habit, weekly habit, monthly habit. The daily habit is to track how you allocate your time and learn from that. Not just operate, but learn from your operations. So every day we write down, and manufacturers, of course, do that. We write down how we allocate our time. But this is the CEO now writing down, okay, six o'clock I'm running, seven breakfast with my kids, eight I'm writing 600 words, uh, 11 sales meeting, 
etc. And in the evening, I ask myself two questions. Of all the things that I did today, which one will I delegate tomorrow? Mm. And if I would live more freely and more intentionally, what would I do tomorrow? Those are profound. I mean, those, just let me pause on that because I think those are two. So there's a couple of things, right? So a lot of people listening might say, well, I keep a calendar. But I sense in the way you're describing this, there's, a, there's another level of intentionality in how you do that planning. It's not just keeping a calendar, which often are things that other people put on your calendar, right? Other, they're, they're the interrupts. They're the appointments that either your staff or your customers or whatever have put on your calendar. But you're talking about a different kind of, I think, mindset of how you look at your, at, at your daily habits. And then those two questions at the end are really pretty profound. So what about somebody saying, well, listen, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm just, I'm toast. You know, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to have dinner. How, how long should I, you know, I can't spend, um, I can't, I don't want to get into the fetal position thinking about how terrible my day was. How do I turn this into something that's actually an enjoyable habit? What, what have you seen happen? Calendar is great. And if you really use your calendar, well, that's that's the strongest thing you can you can have. Most people don't really use the calendar because they have stuff in there, but they don't they don't take it uh, as 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 fact. Uh, it's just a proposal to them. So my calendar is also um, up to date. And but on top of that, I do my daily flow here. It's it's just writing down, okay, six, I was running, eight, I was doing stuff, etc. So you see interview, interview, show, etc. That's my daily flow. And here it has these two fields for people listening. It has two fields that, that nudge me. When I close down the day, for me, it's 6 p.m. I stop working and I could, of course, go up until 11 p.m. I have enough to do. I run a global business. But I say to myself, that's that's the limitation and you need boundaries. So that's the limitation. So we need to prioritize, right? So limitation is 6 p.m. What I have accomplished until there is done. And um, the rest, I close down the day with these two reflective questions. And I write down the flow of tomorrow. So the first question, what will I delegate tomorrow? Oh, let's see. Hmm, I did my own I, I did my own newsletter. Do I really need to write my own newsletter? Maybe not. So newsletter. Then the next question, uh, if I would live more freely, what would I do tomorrow? Hey, I always wanted to write a book. What about the book? So book project started. That's an example. And then I write down the flow of tomorrow. And my, and my flow is always kind of similar, but it is intentional to create it. You know, you're committing to something while you write it down. And so you, you, you would plan your tomorrow. I mean, I know this is, this may sound like one one to some people, but I know for a lot of people, we know the theory, but living it out is different, right? So we, again, we all have calendars. We all have a day timer. Well, these days, everything's on, like, on your phone, but it doesn't mean that you're, it seems like there's a little habit here of that reflection at the end of the day and then planning out your flow for the next day. Now you use a term for scheduling. It, I don't think, I don't know if you mean it interchangeably, but I just caught it and I want to just expand on it a little bit flow. So why mm -hmm. use the word flow instead of just your schedule? Yeah. Manufacturers get this word because it comes from there. So to me, it's not a linear thing. It's a flow of things. You have to think like manufacturing, when you are building something, you start with raw material and then it gets grossly refined and then it gets fine refined. Mm -hmm. And at the end, it's a finished product and you ship it. The, the same thing happens with ideas and the day has a certain flow. My, my raw material, my body, my energy, my attention, my time, these are my raw materials. They need a certain flow during the day. That's why I start with running one hour. That's around eight, nine kilometers because I bring me myself in peak state, peak energy. My attention, my energy will go up before I do anything. And then of course I play with my kids and then there is deep work, which is uninterrupted work. Nobody can book time into my mornings. Not, it's not gonna happen. So interviews start in the afternoon. 
Okay. Um, meetings late afternoon. My own podcast latest afternoon. It's five o'clock. It's the only slot that you can have because five minutes before six p.m. What am I gonna do? Close down the day, reflect the two question, and plan the next day. And then six p.m. I'm I'm in the kitchen and either cooking with my kids or playing with my kids, and my wife cooks, and it's it's family time. Hey, pardon the interruption. It'll just be a beat. We want to tell you about something that's really exciting, and it might be very exciting to you if you're the owner, CEO, leader of a B two B company, roughly with two to twenty million dollars in revenue, and you feel a little bit stuck. You know what I mean? Sales are a little flat, maybe even declining. Challenge margins are being squeezed. Sales cycles seem to be lengthening, and lead flow is uncertain. We designed the program based on over a dozen years of us doing exactly this. For many B two B companies, it's called the Competitive Edge Program, and you can learn more about it at ValueProp.com forward slash Edge.、It、tells you all about the program. It's a ninety day program, really focused on helping you sharpen your value proposition, aligning your value delivery, making sure your marketing program is doing what it has to do if you're in B two B, which is generate opportunities, and make sure your sales process is tight. So that you can convert those opportunities into sales. So, with that note, let's get back to an exciting episode of the Revenue Throughput Podcast. Wow! So that now, how long have you been able to keep that rhythm? And especially in light of other things happen, right? There are other circumstances. A key employee quits.、Uh, a, a deal you thought was in the bag, you were promised you were going to get it. You were counting on it. All of a sudden. Sorry, Simon. I have、uh, news for you. You know, we decide to go with you know Acme instead, and you go, "What? How did that happen?" And stuff happens in life, right? So, how do you deal with the stuff happens in life and still keep that flow as consistently as you're as you're able to do? Great question. And you know, I have buffer time. This is also something that I learned from manufacturing. I have buffer time. You know, theory of constraints、mm -hmm. and how you you plan flow. You have always buffer time. We know that somebody is gonna quit their job, and I get a video, Simon. I'm quitting. We know that it's ten percent of the year. I have fluctuation in on my employees. That that's how things work, right? And then you have black swan events, and we know that we will have these events. And so, in the afternoon, some blocks are movable because, for example, today in the afternoon I have a block. It's one hour. It's called thinking time. And there is one question. I, every week I have a different question. This week the question is: If I 10x the supply, what will break?、Uh, sorry, the demand. If I 10x the demand, which part breaks? Right. It's a simple question, and I will walk for one hour thinking about this because this is working on form and function of my delivery system, and it's important. That's a CEO job. I have to do that for one hour. Now, if something pops up, and it might pop up, for example, right now the old coins are down ten percent. So guess what? I'm gonna skip the thinking time, and I'm gonna do shopping time. <laughs> It's shopping time,、uh, and so that hour can be changed. Now, if before shopping time I get a video and an employee says I'm quitting, Simon, well, then I need to go do the job scorecard instead of shopping, and I and.、Um, To go to on LinkedIn and say I'm looking for this job. I see.、Yeah. What? So, but the but it's interesting because we see it seems like supply chains that you know a lot of which have been built around the theory of constraints and the influence of the goal and all of that you know for the last thirty years. Yet on it seems on a global level everyone left out the buffer. They got so efficient、yes. <laughs> that there was like zero buffer in many cases. They just went that because everybody got really good at just in time. Everything's doing it that way. But it's kind of like、uh, I'm, I'm teaching my son to drive, and and teaching about the principle of the speed bump, right? And I said you really have to slow the car down because you hit that speed bump at speed,、uh, that car goes flying. You could lose control. It's a really bad thing. So lack of buffer is like guaranteeing that you're going to hit the speed bump really hard at, with bad results. Now, so far we've talked about as an individual, right? Managing your time, doing that. And I think for a lot of our listeners who are CEOs and owners and so on, it could be very practical. Could be a really a reminder of yeah, I used to do that. You know, I was very disciplined, and discipline is one of those things that 
unless you a discipline of keeping it, you start losing it, right? But how do you translate that organizationally? Like how would you how would you what's the equivalent for those habits in in a, even a small company, a 20, 30 person team? Everybody kind of knows their job, everybody's a good person doing their work. How do we escalate performance using some of these principles? What is the smallest unit of a company? It's the employee. Okay. And so there is an SOP and it's week, week zero when we onboard a new person, we say, look, we operate on these principles. There is the daily habit, the weekly habit and the monthly habit. This is what we do. That's our operational system. And you are expected to every day write down how you allocate your time, learn from it, and the next day delegate something. And if you don't have employees to delegate, your job is to hire these people in your area. So we have areas, marketing area, ops area, sales area. If you are in the marketing area, and you have to learn from how you allocate your time and you have to get better. You have to get smarter. You have to find the highest leveraging point for your time and you have to get rid of the lowest um, time uh, levers. So if you find that something is automatable, it's your job to automate it. If you find that something is delegatable, it's your job to hire somebody and um, you know how the budgeting process is and um, you know where to get the job description and then you go hire that person and make that part of your processes. Because we are all leaders in my organization. I don't want anybody who is not a leader. So I expect from everybody what I do, I expect from everybody to do. Every day, uh, time allocation and learning from it, delegating. I expect from everybody to have the three numbers in order. That's the, the weekly habit, marketing numbers, ops numbers, and sales numbers. Whatever your area is, I expect you to have your numbers always in real time ready. And every seven days, we learn from them as a team. And every month, you are part of the strategic analysis session. That's the monthly habit. Are we swimming in the right direction at the right pace? What are competitors doing? You are part of that conversation. Whatever your role is in the company, you will be part of that conversation. It's one hour per month. We check our competitors. We check our vision and if we are moving towards it and if we have to change something. So even in an organization where somebody is doing a job that wouldn't typically be seen as a strategic role, right? They're not a C-suite person. They're not head of anything directly. Uh, but they, in, in software, they could be, you know, they're a developer doing front-end interfaces, something like that, right? So it's the equivalent of a manufacturing job, right? Uh, the, the person, op the operator job. You would suggest including them in that strategic conversation. Yes. So we design every single position as same as a leading position. So they, they are expected to do the job, but also to document the job and also to improve the job. And also to make sure that they lead the job. So they will hire also and they will improve and scale that part of the business. They will always make sure that it is aligned with the main strategy and with the main three goals of the next three months. And what does it mean? It means that I want them to learn from their day, to improve it. And if they have an improvement that they don't know how, they know who to ask. There is a process for that. It's the daily scrum where they ask, I have an obstacle and I need this in 15 minutes. So we have all these loops and I expect them to use them. Whatever your position is, let's say it's bookkeeping. And then somebody says, yeah, but that's just a task, right? Yeah, but I want you also to document the process of how bookkeeping is done, improve it. Sometimes you need to digitize it, to automate it, to make it cheaper. That's your job. You will optimize it. And, and sometimes you need more support that you have to hire. I will make care. I will take care that this process works and that everybody is reporting in the right pace, in the right quality, and that everybody's learning and moving forward. But I am not micromanaging, you know, everybody is a leader. So that's interesting because you mentioned bookkeeping, which, you know, it's almost like a, 
it's almost like a, a, a catch word for mundane, relatively boring, simple tasks, right? But in reality, you know, you look at bookkeeping process done right, it could mean the difference between giving the leadership team current information by a difference of a couple of days. So what does that matter? It depends on the market you're in, but it could be very important. Can we buy some more raw material? Well, how do we know? We have to we have to close our books. I've heard that. You know, we have to know how we ended last month. And even though, yes, there's modern accounting systems are kind of real time, you still need the act of a human being verifying numbers, making sure something is booked in the proper category. So I could even see in bookkeeping that actually having strategic implications. So yes. it's kind of like saying there are no little jobs. They all matter because they all make the system of the business work. Yes, and if they don't matter, we should keep them around. You know, we should stop doing it. Uh, processes that don't matter anymore. Bookkeeping is so important. It's cash flow management. Mm. It's deciding who to hire, when to hire, how to hire, uh, if senior or not senior to hire. That's all from the cash flow management. And we have we have done our best work in really improving our own cash flow. Uh, and PNL reports, and this has made us kind of famous. People want our templates, and that's how we, we get clients because they see that we get reported first the profit and and net profit. So we have gross margin, operating margin, and net uh, profit first. Then we have the cost positions. Then we have the cash flow. You know everything coming in and out, and we get this every seven days in one simple spreadsheet. You don't have to click anything. You don't have to search for anything. Right. You needed this information, like how much profits did we do this week? You click one link. It's a spreadsheet. Everybody has access to it. This is beautiful. And this is the art of running a business. It's an art and science right. of running a business. So, and I'm, I'm absolutely, um, like, like you said, there is no task that has not a relevance and an elegance uh, in it, and every you know this is my this is my where when you have all the tasks working together well, operation, sales, and marketing, then magic happens, right? If you have them, if one of them is not aligned, you have a problem. As soon as they are aligned, magic happens. That's wow. right. That's well, an I'm fascinated about that. So looking, that's a great visual metaphor too, Simon, because. You know, you can't say any one of those digits is more important because any one of them could keep the, the, the magic not happening, the lock locked, and you can't you can't get to where you need to go. So that's that's really great. So so I think uh, the, the one question that remains, though, is you're describing a way of being which is very much to the level of the individual as they connect with the organization. Right. So the individual is empowered. You really want leaders, a leader mindset and so on. How much of that is, how much of that is, re, is, is really baked into the hiring of the individual? Like you got to bring in people with those kind of that DNA or how much of it can a company culture shape into somebody who has the right skill set, but maybe not the right mindset. I guess my question is, do you interview for that mindset being hundred percent present? Or do you expect you're always going to have to teach people coming on board how to think this way? Both. I interview people for that. It's a three parts interview. And the second part is a demo. I, I have them work with me in that hour. Uh, but still, I have some mismatches. And after three months, then we go, uh, so even if even if we have designed to exactly scan for that and and we have a very you know it's coming out uh in february it will be the last chapter of the book strategy sprints is the hiring chapter and i have give away the full checklist it's a very precise checklist of how we hire i give out the full thing i think it's five thousand words just that chapter that's how precise our interview process is. And still, I get some bad hires because one part is still that, yes, culture can, can nudge behaviors out of you, but only if they are there already 
ready to be picked up, right? So it's still very complex to hire. It's still one of the toughest things. And, and it's awful that 10% fluctuation or even more in some years like this year, uh, that's the toughest job as a manager. And uh, even with a great process, still, still tough. Well, actually, uh, believe it or not, I'm actually encouraged by that because I know somebody listening, everybody's dealing with this struggle of how to, how to find people. And when you find them, how to make sure they're the right people. And I know you've really worked a lot on this process and the fact that it can still be challenging and you're doing this on purpose. You're not just winging it, right? You're doing it with a, a great deal of intentionality. It just tells you the human factors is an X factor. Like it's people. And you know, you could ask somebody that was the right person, but has something happened in their life that distracts them. You know, they're going through a divorce or, you know, all, and all of a sudden they become not their best, not the best version of themselves. All kinds of things happen. So it's fascinating. So that just means as a leader, you really have to be on top of this. And I think also with your processes, having those processes in place probably help you identify somebody who's going to make it sooner than later, because those processes kind of show up as to whether or not they're they're with they're on board with the flow or or not, because you actually have a flow. You have an objective way of doing things that people have to learn and adapt to. Uh, Simon, if you had any one quick word of advice as we go into this next year, hopefully we enter a post pandemic world fully, uh, you know, in every way. Um, and somebody who's, you know, a business owner running a few million dollar business wants to grow. What's one thought looking at this next year, two year window, you're looking at coins and the variation of coins. So you're looking at markets. What do you, what's one thought you'd like to share with them? So this year, I would say focus on the three core strategies to de-risk uh, this situation because it's highly volatile and only the ones will survive that really keep focused on these three strategies. Prioritize the things that will increase by 25% your frequency of your sales, the conversion rate and the price. Focus on these three things when you pick projects and do only a few projects per month and have them really contribute to one of these three strategies. If not, put them on the backlog for next year. This year is very volatile. It will be creating value in a way that we have never experienced in our lifetime, uh, some of us will be the big winners and uh, many of us will not be around. So if you want to be in the category big winner, focus on these three things and uh, do not get distracted by the news, by the emotions and by all the misinformation out there. Wow. That's great, Simon. And uh, Simon, if somebody listening said, gee, I'd like to learn more about what Simon does, how he does it, um, how would they get a hold of you? What's the best way for them to find out more about you? We hang out at strategiesprints.com and everywhere socials. So if you say strategies, prints, anywhere in Google, we pop up or Simon Severino, you find me everywhere. Fantastic. Simon Severino, thank you for being our guest today. And thank you for sharing some great stuff for our, for our listeners. Thank you. Keep rolling, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening to another episode of the Revenue Throughput Podcast. If you like this episode, and if you like the series, make sure you subscribe below. And also, if you liked it, please do review it. When people are looking for something exciting to listen to, especially the kind of content we're bringing, which is practical insights for B2B companies, this is a place and a free resource that they can take advantage of. Let them know about it with your review. So subscribe, review, enjoy. Thanks again.